Well, welcome back, everybody. I'm glad you've been able to join us for all of the units. This unit is especially important because as a professional, you need to know when to cite, where to document, how to document other people's work. In graduate and scholarly writing, you are constantly using other people's ideas. So how do you accurately document them? How do you accurately cite them in order for you to be seen as a professional and to not have plagiarism. We'll talk about that big word, that terrible word, in a few minutes. But before we begin, let's look at a couple more article use issues. We've talked a lot about how to use articles, where to use articles. If you've forgotten the three key rules that I've talked about, please review some of the previous slides. But now let's talk about the difference between the and a. This is not an easy lesson, and I'm sure many of you have learned that the is a specific reference and a is a general reference. I wish it were that easy, but let's at least look through some of the complicated issues here. Yes, the is a specific reference. It can be used with countable, it can be used with non-count, with plural and with singular. So statistically, you're going to use more the than you are a. But there's also one other situation where you don't use anything. So we're going to talk about those three differences right now. The is used when the reader knows which one you're talking about. The writer has introduced the subject beforehand, or only one exists, and there are certain words such as the first, the most, the least, the same. We've covered that in previous slides if you need to review it. A, on the other hand, is a general reference and is only used for singular countable nouns. So the first time you mention a singular countable noun, you probably will use a. It also means when it doesn't matter which one, anyone will do, so it's a generalization. Let's look at some of those examples. A mobile device, anyone, it doesn't matter which one, can connect you to the world. But the mobile device that I have is useful. In this case, we use the because the reader knows which one. Which one? The one I have. Common, it's common to use plurals also for general truths or general references. So for example, mobile devices, plural, are useful. Any ones, all of them, doesn't matter which one, I'm just giving you a general truth or a generalization. Or international graduate students are smart. Which ones? Doesn't matter. All of them, any of them, are smart. But the international graduate students at the University of Minnesota are smart. Now you know which ones. It's not a general truth. It is, a, it is about a certain group of students. Notice that, of course, you don't use a or an because it's plural. So we use nothing in this case. Keep this one in mind because when we talk about citations, we're going to talk about generalizations. Often those generalizations are plural and there is no the or a reference. They are simply talking about any and all. So keep that in mind. We'll come back to that. When to use a general reference article a or a plural? The first mention. I want a new computer. Anyone will do. Any computer. The computer must have. Which computer? The one that I just mentioned a new computer. So the first time I mention it, it's a, and the second time I mention it, the same one, then I'll switch to the. When you're referring to any or all in a group, or when it doesn't matter which one, we also use a. A student has to work hard. Volunteerism is important to a community. Notice volunteerism is a non-count noun, so we don't use any a or the, but a community. Which community? Any community. So a community. An American student at the University of Minnesota has to work hard. Which one? Anyone at the University of Minnesota. A cat, which cat? Any cat, can destroy furniture with his claws. 
We also have these generalizations, as I just mentioned. Those are always plural, and they don't have any reference the or a. Stem cells, which ones? Any and all are important for such and such. Students, which ones? Any and all have to work hard. So we have a situation where you have first mention, countable, and singular. You need a or an, of course. For non-count nouns, we use nothing. When it doesn't matter which one, we use a. And for the generalizations, they're plural, and we don't use anything. We don't use the, and we don't use a. So another question that students often have is, when do you use any, with a singular or with a plural? We Actually, the truth is you can do it for either one. Most often we use it with a singular, but let's look at these examples. We don't know any student who loves studying, or we don't know any students who love studying. Do you know any student, anyone, who can lend me some money, or do you know any students who can lend me some money. Those two sentences might have a little bit different interpretation. In the first one, do you know any student? I'm assuming only one student. Do you have any students, maybe multiple students, would be willing to lend me some money? Okay, last point, anyone and anybody. In formal writing, anybody is less formal than anyone. But I want you to notice anybody and anyone in these both of those situations it's one word if you separate them into two words it actually changes the meaning never use any body with two words unless you mean the physical body uh, so maybe you come ac across a crime scene and you say um, I don't see any body laying on the road so that would be the physical body that's laying on the road or, in another situation, any and one means something different than anyone. We do not know of any one element that exists. One element is very different than anyone, of course. The correct one would be, we do not know anyone who can lift that weight. Any person, anyone, one word. Okay, let's move on to citations. This big word, plagiarism. It's a horrible word. It sounds horrible. It sounds like really, really awful, but we need to talk about it because it's such a common word in the United States and in scholarly work. Plagiarism is forbidden. In the United States, it's a very serious offense. It's something that all professors and, uh, and readers, for that matter, they read suspiciously. Is this plagiarism? So there's awful consequences of plagiarism. You might fail the paper, or I've known a student who's fit or two that have failed a prelim because they have committed plagiarism. You could get a failing grade for the course. You could lose professional respect. You could even lose a degree or a position if the plagiarism is particularly what we call egregious or seems intentional but any form of plagiarism is considered a serious offense. So this is one of the things that every writer is a little bit scared about. I find that a lot of international students aren't scared enough. And I don't want to scare you necessarily, but you do actually have to be a little bit scared, scared enough, so you learn the rules and learn how to avoid plagiarism. The good news. Plagiarism is avoidable if you understand what it is, you understand what citations are, you understand where to put citations accurately, and you look at your writing like your reader looks at your writing. Your reader wants to know what ideas are yours and what ideas are someone else's, and where can your reader find more information about someone else's uh, ideas that you have in your paper. So what is it? The first and probably the worst is submitting a paper that you didn't write. Okay, everybody knows that that's cheating. Everybody around the world considers that plagiarism. 
So of course you want to avoid that. Copying from sources and pretending you wrote it yourself. So maybe you just you didn't submit a whole paper from someone else, but you copied from several sources and pretended that you wrote it yourself. How did you pretend? You didn't use any sources, so therefore it's yourself. Everybody knows that that's cheating as well. I find that in every country, these first two are considered plagiarism. It may not be taken as seriously as here, but it's, it's very, very serious in, in any scholarly situation. Using a source and saying it is, a, it is a different source. In other words, you incorrectly will uh, cite a different source. That's also cheating. In other words, you are not careful enough, even if it's by accident, it's still considered plagiarism and it's something that you absolutely need to avoid. If you use author's ideas and other author's ideas without giving that author credit, that also is considered plagiarism. And at this level, at the graduate and scholarly level, this is usually the main source of plagiarism. The first three, for sure, you're not going to be committing. You've already learned the lessons, I'm sure, I hope. But this last one, where do you give credit? How do you give credit? That's the important issue that you need to avoid. The problem is that it's confusing. Honestly, even for Americans, although most professors won't admit that it's really confusing, it truly is. Many Americans learn how to do citations from a very early age. My daughter, when she was 10 years old, began learning about plagiarism. She came home from school. She was worried about the fact that her classmate had plagiarized. And I looked at this little girl, 10 years old, and I thought, you know the word plagiarism already. That's amazing. And she was worried that her classmate had not documented, had not shown where he had gotten the information he'd, he'd written about. So at a very young age, we began to get a sense of what is plagiarism, how to avoid plagiarism, and we began to learn how to avoid it. So let's learn how to do it. Writing a paper with other people's ideas is like talking to your reader. You make it clear who said what, who thought what, is this your idea or the other person's idea. Sometimes you use the exact words of that author and sometimes you paraphrase or change the words of the author but keep the same idea. Unfortunately for you, we do a lot more paraphrasing than we do the exact words. But we always make it clear which words and thoughts are another author's and which ones are our own. In order to do that, we have to figure out what are the conventions, what are the ways that we've all agreed on, these are the ways that we do things. These are the ways that we show that it's somebody else's idea or show that it's our idea. So those are the things that we're going to concentrate on in this unit. So why does plagiarism matter? Here's what I have found, that U.S. education system values independent thinking. You know that. We need to be very clear about what's our thinking and what somebody else's ideas. What is the author's idea and what is our reaction to or perception of or interpretation of the other author's ideas. We need to make that clear in ways that everybody understands, okay, this was that author's and this is your own. Professors value that independent thinking even more when it draws upon research and the ideas of others. In other words, you're constantly, particularly in graduate and scholarly writing, showing your ideas. But just to say something without any proof, without any support, means that it's a weak argument. So you need other people's ideas, other people's research um, <clears throat> in your own writing. And when you do that, you need to cite what is the other person's and what is your own. So U.S. law also stresses intellectual property rights. This is huge in business, in writing, in, in everything. We claim our ideas as our own. 
By citing the other author's ideas, you are showing respect for and uh, intellectual property rights of someone else's ideas. You respect their ownership of their work and their ideas. This is fundamental in, in academic writing as well as in, in law. So let's begin. I've used a lot of these words, but I want to make sure everybody understands what are the definitions of each of these words. First, documentation. That's the concept of giving credit to someone else's work. I'm going to talk about documentation and documentation style. So there are several different styles, and that just refers to how do you document, how do you cite other people's work. Citation. This is the actual reference in the text or in the references section. In the text meaning in the paragraphs and there are several different kinds of citation styles. We'll talk about that in a minute. The references section obviously is at the end and the in-text is within the paragraphs. Attribution. Attribution means that you are giving credit to someone else. So you might in a sentence say he notes. Who notes? You have already given the citation, Holt, and now the next sentence, you say he. Or if there's several authors, you say they. That word they or he is giving attribution. It is saying this is still the other author's work, not my own. Plagiarism is stealing someone else's ideas in the way that I've just described in several different ways. A style manual. Every journal has a style manual and it says in this journal we use such and such documentation style. And if you are in a field there is a certain documentation style you use in that field or at least uh, it's one of the choices in that field. So documentation needs to be in the text as well as in the references. All of these concepts are important for understanding plagiarism. So why is it so complicated? I wish it weren't so complicated, but it is. Each field has its own style. Now they follow similar conventions, but you need to figure out in your field what is the documentation style that is most acceptable. It can vary by fields. Even journal by journal it can vary. You need to look at the style manual of that journal if you're going to submit publication. And it's also sometimes unclear what's common knowledge and what's unique to one author. So there are things that aren't your idea, but everybody understands. Everybody has accepted Barack Obama at the moment is the President of the United States. I don't need to go and find documentation for that, at least in the United States and probably around the world. That's common knowledge. So even though that's not my idea, I don't need to document it. You might forget what's your own idea and what's been formulated through much reading. So all of us read and read and read and read and read, and then we come up more or less with our own perspective. So at what point does it become our perspective, and what do you have to document from your previous reading? What's unique to someone else, and what's acceptable in the field, or what's your own perspective? That's not always, always really clear, but you need to start getting the feeling of where's that gray area, what is exactly your own, what is exactly someone else, and you need to start understanding that from the U.S. point of view. It may also be difficult to know what other uh, authors might want to look up more detail. So it might be somewhat common knowledge or not necessarily something that needs to be documented, but your readers might actually want to know more information about that topic. And so at what point do you put in maybe a footnote or you cite so that they can read more detail about that information. You also may come from a country where documentation standards are different than in the U.S. So you may have little experience with the documentation standards in the U.S. and you need to, I would say, catch up with your peers in what is acceptable and what's not acceptable in the United States documentation styles. So documentation styles, I've already mentioned several times that there are many, and this is only a partial list, but every field has more or less a style that they will tend to follow. The reason that I mention this is if you can figure out what is the documentation style of your field, 
or most closely of your field, you can then go on the internet and, or other resources and find out exactly how you do it. You don't have to guess. So of this list, is your field listed on this list? If not, ask a mentor, ask your advisor, ask somebody, what is the documentation style that we use? So that you can figure out what is it that you need to do in that documentation style. You can't make up your own. You can't say, oh, I like this, and I like this, and I like this. You need to follow the conventions, the formal conventions of that documentation style. So here's two key guidelines to help you avoid plagiarism. We're going to go through each of these a little bit more clearly, but let me just lay it out before we begin. First, when you use direct quotations, you cite others' work in the proper documentation style using quotation marks. If it is the exact words, then you need to have the document, the, the um, quotation marks. In the US we use double quotation marks, not single quotation marks. In other English speaking countries they use single marks. You also in most documentation styles need to introduce the author in some way according to Holt or Holt described da da da. So in direct quotations also in the sentence is the author's name or the source. When you're using indirect quotations, or in other words, paraphrase, you still need to cite that other author's work in the proper documentation style. You don't have a page number, you don't have quotation marks, but you still need to show that this isn't your idea. It comes from someone else. So you need proper documentation for both direct quotations and paraphrase. So what do you need to document? Look at this long list. To avoid plagiarism, you must give credit whenever you use the following. Any facts, statistics, graphs, drawings, ideas, or others' opinions, whether written or spoken, such as at a conference, that are not at your own. Any information that is not common knowledge must be documented. This includes not only direct quotations of others' work, actual spoken or written words, but also paraphrases of others' other person's spoken or written words. My goodness, all of this seems like you can't have anything in your paper that isn't documented. Well, in part that that's, that's true, in part it's not. Any interpretations of those back statistics graphs, any discussion of them, you give the source of the original and then you will probably give your own perspective. Your own perspective is of course not documented. So, what don't you document? Ideas, opinions, interpretations, and research that's your own. If it's your own idea, your own opinion, your own interpretation, you give what did the author say, and now, and you document that, and now what's your interpretation? And you don't, of course, document your own interpretation. Any widely known ideas, that's, we call that common knowledge, and a few famous quotations from literature you wouldn't have to go back and cite. So Shakespeare's to be or not to be, that is the question. That is such a famous quote that we wouldn't go back and give documentation. But the first two are the ones that are used most in academic writing. So let's deal with this issue of common knowledge. What's common knowledge? There's four kind of tests that you can use. Is this information original or unique to another person? Does it only appear in one book or one article or maybe one author kind of came up with a theory and is the, the, the grandfather or grandmother of this theory? Then that would have to be documented. That person's name or where that information is found would need to be in your paper. Number two, is there any doubt or another point of view about this information? Is this controversial? Do you use a point of view, maybe it is your point of view, but there's an opposite point of view? Then you may want to go and find an author or authors that have that point of view, so it's supporting your opinions. Just to have your own opinion, is probably not enough. You want to show that there's support in the literature about that opinion. Number three, 
Would a reader want more information about that source of information? Though sometimes the information, it's, the, it's put in the footnote, okay, for more information about this topic, see blah, blah, blah. But if the, you think the reader would want more information, more detail, then we also cite that so that they can find in your references section where's more information. And number four, are there several authors or, or sources that support or agree an, on an idea, theory, or trend? This is called a generalization. Many, many, many uh, fields use generalizations. For example, in the literature review, you're going to find a generalization. I'm going to give you several examples of that in a few minutes. But you still need to then have several sources, several authors that support that idea. If the answer to any of these questions is yes, then you for sure need documentation. It's not common knowledge. Or at least you need to cite something to support uh, your, your information. So here's some common questions. What if you have read the information somewhere, but you don't remember where you learned it? So this happens so often. We read, 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 and then we come to write and go, hmm, was that my idea or was that something I read? And fortunately, it's your responsibility to keep track of what you've read and where you read it. If you forget, you need to go back and find it again. That's why we have so many citation manager software. Most libraries will have the software. You can buy the software. Your department has it so that you can keep track of that information. So when you're writing, you remember and use the citation of where you found it. Number two, what if you believe or know something from your own experience, but your readers wouldn't know or would question this information? Maybe you grew up in a country and believe it because of your experience in that country. Now again, if it's not common knowledge to your reader and they might question it, then I would go and find other sources that have documented it, studied it, verified it, and use that to support your own idea. If you can't do that, then use yourself as the credibility. Based on my 20 years living in blah blah country, um, and then you use yourself in a sense as the expert, but if you just make that statement without any kind of source or credibility, then your readers might question it and think it's plagiarism. What if you read information in one article that author, but that author was reporting the information from another one? Which article do you document? In other words, you're reading my article. In my article, I cite a previous article. Now, you don't care about my article, but you care about that previous article. Well, the answer to that mostly is look at my references and in the text and in the references section and go back to the original. Go back to the original and use the original article in your paper. What if I maybe interviewed somebody and there was no original article. In my references section it says interview on such and such a date. So you can't go back to any original. Every documentation style has a way for you to cite from a secondary source. In other words, you would use something like as quoted in Holt 2010 or as cited in Holt 2010. So you not you have to cite my article, but you are showing that it is somebody else, not me, that's saying it. Look in your documentation style. How do they do that so that you are using a secondary store source instead of the original source? Okay. What if you want to cite your own previous work? You've written a previous article. Now you want to cite that article. It's kind of funny, but you actually have to cite your own work and for two reasons. First, you want to show your own work. You want to put that in the references section and in the, in the text because you want to highlight the fact that you have previous work and you want your readers to read that previous work. Secondly, it's not just your work. It belongs to the journal 
where you published it. So you actually have to cite your own work. Now, we do it in a little funny way. We don't say I in my previous work. You say Holt. Who's Holt? Well, I'm Holt. Holt 2010 noted that. So you are literally using your own last name and the reference year or however your documentation style does it so that you can cite your own work. You want to be sure to give credit to yourself and to your previous work. So let's do a little exercise. Open your books to page 135. Here are the sentences that I want you to struggle with. Now I know you don't know the context, you don't know what section it's in, but let's just talk through some of the issues and do you need to cite or don't you need to cite. Okay, open your books. Uh, if you can, stop the tape and actually look through these uh, five sentences and figure out do you think you need documentation or not. Okay, let's go over them. Lyme disease. Lyme disease is a common disease here in the United States, by the way. Um, it's a mosquito-borne disease, and it can make somebody very sick, okay? So Lyme disease has become prevalent in previous years. Do you need to document that or not document that? Well, the question, is this common knowledge, or is it something that you need to go back and find information on? I suggest that in most fields, it's not common knowledge. Even if it is, there's a word in here that's a little bit controversial, prevalent. What does prevalent mean? How many is prevalent? And so I think, even if you think this is common knowledge, your readers might question this. So you would want to put some references, some sources to prove this information, Lyme disease has become prevalent. Number two, the epidemic disease was investigated by numerous methods including, and it has several methods. Now whose methods are these? If you found this in, a, in the method section, in your method section, then it would be pretty obvious it's your methods. But if this was in the literature review section, or maybe in another section, then clearly investigated by numerous methods gives the idea this isn't your methods, this is somebody else's methods. And I would need to have a reference or maybe several references, different kinds of methods that different authors have used. So clearly this needs to be documented unless it's your own methods. Number three. The results demonstrated an overall increase. Now because the sentence starts with the results, I hope that you have already given a reference, a citation, to whose results. And this, maybe the citation comes before this. If the previous sentence gives the citation, then the results needs to refer to the previous sentence. So this sentence probably doesn't need a reference, but the previous sentence would. This is a good place for me to mention. The first time you refer to somebody else's work, you need the citation. The next time, the next sentence, needs some attribution. The attribution here is the results. Which results? The one that you mentioned in the previous uh, sentence or it that may be the top of the paragraph. You need to figure out where do you put the first citation. If you put it just at the end of the paragraph, it's too late. Okay, so this one definitely needs some citation, either a previous sentence or, if it's not in a previous sentence, it needs to go at the end of this sentence, which results. If they are your results, then the, in the results section, then of course you don't use a citation because it's your own. Number four, the United Nations Development Program declares that its mission is to, and now you have a direct quote. Do you need to cite it? Yes, you definitely need to. Now if in your references section, it's the reference is United Nations Development Fund, 
or program, sorry, the United Nations Development Program, if that's in your references section, then that's the citation in the text. But you, in most citation styles, documentation styles, you also need a page number. So that page number needs to be here. And if this is a different source than United Nations Development Program, you also would need the source. Maybe the source comes out of Holt's article, and you need to show this comes out of Holt's article. Nevertheless, someplace here you need the page number and the documentation. Number five, the future availability of high resolution digital elevation modes, DEM, presents a series of questions about their use in terrain analysis for applications such as soy sam soil samples. Are these your questions? I assume they're your questions. If they're your questions, then you don't need to have any documentation. If this came from another source, or if it was a direct quote from another source, then clearly you need to have a, a, a source, a citation for this. Do you see how complicated this is? This is telling the reader where do these ideas come from? Are they yours or are they someone else's? This is like a conversation with the reader. And using citations tells the reader if this comes from another source, if it does, where, who, what page, all of those things come into play when you are doing citations. Okay, let's stop and look at a journal article in your field. Would you pull out that article? Where do you see a reference or a citation? Look in the text. How have they done that? Why have they chosen to give documentation to that concept? What's the format they use in that journal article? Look at the references section and the corresponding name. So in the text, you're going to see uh, some kind of citation, a number, a name, a last name, some kind of citation. And now look at the references section and see that as well. How does it correspond? Literature reviews clearly have citations. So if you, if you want to know where to look, most of the time in the introduction of that journal article, the first part, you're going to see several citations of previous literature. Look at the style. Take some time. Really, really look at, at those citations. Most of us, when we read, we just skip over that part and we go to what we think is important. But I want you to stop and, and study some of those citations. Okay, moving on. There are three key concepts. Number one, you need to paraphrase others' work whenever possible unless there's a specific reason to use a direct quote. This isn't good news, but the truth is we far prefer paraphrase over direct quotes. Number two, we like to take a larger section of work and summarize it instead of just quoting the entire part. And number three, when giving a generalization, we will list several authors. So let's, let's look at the example I, I've given. International students struggle with writing. Well, that's my idea. It's based on my years of teaching. But there are also several other authors who have published work showing that international students struggle with writing. So I list Holt, Yang, and Tyrone. And I give the years. Now this is the APA documentation style. You might be using a different one. But you notice it's not reference to one person. This is a generalization. This is a general truth. It is just a statement. But I need to show who has done work in this field. And they have found international students struggle with writing. So let's look at each of these citation patterns. The first is a short quotation. You all recognize this. You have Anand, he's the author, noted that. Notice that it's in the past tense. We'll talk about tense a little bit later. And then there is a direct quotation, and then the page number, and the period. The period should go after the, uh, the direct quotation. So we have author, year, and page number. Not all citation styles, documentation styles, have page numbers, 
but, but if it does, notice where does that go. We also occasionally, not very often, have block or indented quotations. That's 40 words or four lines that are exactly the same as the original. So this is a quotation, Hoover, he's the author, year 1998, asks us to consider the following, colon, and then indented the four lines, five lines in this case, and all of that is a direct quote. There are no quotation marks because the indentation shows that it's a direct quote and then the page number is at the end. The next citation pattern is this paraphrase and summary. This is by far the most common. The next most common is, cita is generalizations. But in this one, there's only a little bit that's quoted. We'll, we'll look at that. Anon, the author's last name, 2004, notes. I'm changing this to the present tense. We'll talk about these tenses here in a few minutes. Notes that there is a is great pressure from the world communica com uh, community to negotiate peace instead of war. He claims that in recent years the world has become so interconnected that there is only a quote slim chance quote that any one country could go to war by itself without support from surrounding countries. So you notice that most of this is a paraphrase but there's two words slim chance. I don't want to paraphrase that. I want to show this is really what Anand said and it's it's kind of a special phrase. So I quote just those two words, put just those in quotes, and then I uh, paraphrase the rest. In some documentation styles you also need the page number because you've got a direct quote, but um, but notice that most of this is a summary paraphrase, not a quotation. The third pattern is generalizations. In research papers, we often use these. We might say researchers, meaning several researchers, have found blah, blah, blah. Or studies, several studies indicate. Or it might just be a general truth. Great efforts have been made to train international students to write and publish their research. We need citations for each of these. Usually we have two, three, maybe four citations. A few fields they will list up to ten citations, but most of the time it's, it's relatively few. But we still, even though they are just general sentences, we still need to use citations. Look on page 146 for more, um, some more examples of this. Sometimes you want to combine sources, and so here's again, few researchers. How many? Not very many, but I need to show you which ones. And so I list those at the end. It, this particular documentation style uses numbers, but others might use the author's last name and the years, but you still have this generalization where you have documented more than one researcher. We also have a pattern under general um, generalizations where you list all of the authors and then the next sentence separates the ideas. So read through this one. Notice that the first sentence has three authors and then the second sentence separates which of the ideas come from each of those authors. You can look at that pattern more in the book if you wish. Okay, here we have, um, and I'll give you the citation in a minute, you have an, an author who has looked at 100 citations by field. Now, I wish he would have done a couple of other fields, but let's look, the first two are maybe the sciences, the next two are engineering, it would be similar for computer science, marketing, business is the next one, and the last three are the social sciences. I wish there were a couple of more, but I want you to know, notice a pattern here. The top of this graph, direct quotations and block quotations. Look at how few of all of the citations, how few are direct or block quotations. 
This is bad news because many of you like direct quotations. It doesn't make sense because it's like they have perfect words, they have edited words, and now you have to change that into a summary paraphrase. But look how many summary paraphrases and how many generalizations there are. Unbelievable. Out of a hundred citations, by far the most are summary paraphrase and the second are mostly generalizations. So that means that you have the hard work of having to summarize and paraphrase or give generalizations. If you want more uh, rep information about Highland's work, um, I've given you a list here at this, um, this website. So again, let's look at the journal articles that you have in front of you. Note, find a paraphrase summary. Has the author been introduced in the text? What verb and what verb tense is used? Where is the citation? Has there been a partial um, quotation? And if so, is there a page number? And then find a generalization. And see also if you can find where they might say, for example, and just give an example of the work, or do they just list the author's names? really stop the tape right now and look at those journal articles. How do they use it in your own field? Okay, let's go back to quoting. Let's look at some specifics. When do you want to quote? Maybe there's a controversial statement, something that you don't want to paraphrase because you want to show, no, this is really what the original author said or when the original author's exact position needs to be emphasized. In other words, accuracy is really, really important. Also, if you're quoting from literature, novels, poems, you don't want to paraphrase that. Um, or if you are doing interviews and you want to show exactly what the interviewer said, you don't want to paraphrase what he or she said. So these are the places where it really is appropriate to quote. But that's not the most of our citations. Most of our citations is you're just using the ideas from someone else's work, and so you're going to summarize and paraphrase. But obviously, we have a reason to quote. When you quote, you need the exact words, none of your own words inserted. The quotation marks go around the parts that are exactly quoted. It could be partial sentences instead of whole sentences, but you do need to have quotation marks only around the words that are not your own. So often you use phrases to introduce those quotes. According to Holt, there are blah, 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 or Holt et al's perspective is, or Holt suggests that, or one recent report describes it as. Most documentation styles insist that you have where this information came from in the sentence itself, not just in uh, a list of authors, uh, the list of the author at the end. So what do you include? You have the author's last name, Zhao, notes that, and then you, uh, you have the year of publication, and at the end you have the page number. Or in other citation styles, you introduce the author, you have the quotation marks, and number two, which is the citation. There's another interesting thing with quotations. Sometimes you don't want to quote a really long part, so you take some words out of the middle. I want you to notice here that we have these ellipses, these three dots. The three dots indicate that you have left something out. You have not done everything that this author has said, and so you use this ellipsis, the three dots, to show that there's something left out. There's another special situation. If you have a quote inside a quote, you are quoting from one author, but that author has quoted someone else. And so you need to use a different method. For the original, you use the double quotation marks. For the quote inside the quote, you use the single quotation marks. 
at least in the United States, that's what we're looking for is the quote inside the quote. So if you your habit or if you are influenced by the British and use a single quotation mark, then we're looking for the outside quotation marks, the double quotes. So look at this example. You'll notice that it's a quote inside a quote. Sometimes you want to add emphasis. You want to do something inside that quotation. So notice in the sentence, in a statement made to the full assembly, the Secretary General stated, quote, the UN has many obstacles. You make that italics. That wasn't in the original, but for some reason you want to emphasize the word obstacles. So you need to tell the reader hmm, that wasn't like that in the original. So you use brackets and say emphasis mine. In the second situation, you have uh, done an interview with a student and the student made a mistake in grammar. But you want to keep the original student's exact words. You don't want to uh, change the student's words in the interview. So you say, quote, the instructor have not considered the needs of international students in her class, unquote. So you want to show have is a mistake. That wasn't a typo on your part. That's what the student said. So we use this little word, S-I-C, and we put it in brackets. That's telling the reader this is what exactly what the student said. I know it's a mistake, but I'm keeping it in. So we use the little bracket that says sick. Two more rules. In the United States, commas and periods go inside quotation marks. So in other countries, you will notice that it goes outside in other English speaking countries. But here, according to Holt, 2009, comma, and then you have the quotation and the period goes inside, not outside. When you have the citation, the period goes after the citation at the end of the sentence. Look at these two exam three examples. Let's move on to summary paraphrase. Here you take a longer text and you reduce it to a shorter version, focusing on the most important information you want to emphasize. In other words, you're not using the original words. You are taking and take using your own words so that it's easier for your reader. It's easier so that it doesn't sound like, oh, that's his words, that's your words, his words, your words, his words. It's hard to read when you go back and forth in style. So we need to take the longer text, reduce it to something shorter, use your own words instead of the original words. We often change the sentence structure, we might use synonyms, but we try to keep our own writing style but report the information of the original author. So let's look, with, look at what that looks like. I want you to turn off the tape, turn to page 141, and read the examples. There's an original text, and then there are several subsequent paraphrases. Some of those paraphrases are plagiarism, and some of them are not. They're acceptable. They're not plagiarism. So I want you to take time to read those over. I'm not going to read it to you. And notice, why is it plagiarism, or why is it acceptable? After you finish looking at the text, I want you to turn to page 142 and complete exercise 6.2. The original was written by Dr. Jeff Markle, and there are several versions of paraphrases. For each of these versions, I want you to decide if the version is acceptable or not. Is it plagiarism or is it not? Does the student correctly document does he directly report from the original? If the paraphrase doesn't match the, the original, then it's, then it's plagiarism. So look carefully, and then after you have finished this exercise, I want you to go through my answers, but struggle with it first.
Okay, I hope you have actually gone through this exercise because I think it's very, very valuable. And I want you to notice that version one, it's not only that they haven't um, used quotation marks, but it's misleading. It changes the idea of the original article. Look again. If you have, didn't figure that out, look again. How is it misleading? How does it change the original idea? Also, there's too many words that are too close to the original. So he needs to have quotation marks around the exact words. He also doesn't have a reference, and he, he doesn't need to paraphrase numbers. Numbers are some that you can keep. Okay, is the second version any better? No, it's still misleading. It still changes the original meaning of, of Dr. Marco's work. It's out of context. In other words, it mi actually misrepresents what the original was saying. Also, it needs to have quotation marks around the original words. At least there's a reference, that's helpful, but that's not, it's still plagiarism because it changes the original meaning. How about version three? It still lacks context. It doesn't introduce the study or the author. It takes the information out of context. Scared of what? It doesn't tell us that they're scared because of 9-11. It doesn't scared, uh, it just doesn't give any information. So in many ways, this is terrible plagiarism because it just says that they're scared. And so it changes the original idea. It does need quotation marks around a significant number we're often scared. And hopefully it will go on and explain scared of what. And there's no need for page number unless there's a quote. Version four, does it get any better? Well, maybe a little better, but there's still some big problems. It's altered the text so that he has quotation marks around all the words, but some of the words are this student writer's words and not the original, and yet they're quotation marks. You can't have quotation marks around something that wasn't in the original. So use quotations only around the exact words. For the most part, the student has copied and pasted most of the original text, but the introduction is wrong, and he uses children instead of junior hires. He also needs a year of publication, and honestly, does this writer, this student, need all of this information? Can't he paraphrase that down to the most important information instead of just copying and paste? Version 5 gets a little better, except that there's one sentence here that doesn't come from the original. This is the student's interpretation. Look at that last sentence. And also he uses the word questioned instead of interviewed. I don't know, maybe this is being picky, but I like the word interviewed instead of questioned. Questioned has the idea of what did you do? How did you do it? It's kind of a, almost an angry um, thing. So an interviewed sounds much more, um, I don't know, maybe neutral. And why does he put the page number? There's no quotation mark. So he shouldn't have a page number here. Finally, version six is actually pretty good. It's mostly a good paraphrase and documentation. Uh, the thing is, he doesn't need p two periods. Look at the the end. There's a period after the sentence and then there's another period after the citation. You don't need that. Okay, I hope this has been helpful. Just understand that documentation is is more than just where do you put um, the author's name. It has to do with other issues as well. Okay, one other really key idea here is where do you put the citation and what about the rest of the sentences that also refer to that original author's idea. So every sentence that's not your own needs some kind of attribution, some kind of citation. It doesn't need to repeat the author and the year or the other way that you might cite, but it does need to make it clear to the reader which is your idea and which is the original idea, the original author's idea. I want you to notice on page 147, exercise 6.4, read through and underline every reference to the original author, every single reference. When you're finished with that, I want you to look back 
And notice, they use attribution. The authors, they, their, they repeat the author's last names. Every, ref, every sentence that's not this student's writer's idea has some attribu attribution, some kind of word that says, this isn't my own. And they do that by listing the authors or they or their. Now, if it is a single author, now it becomes a little bit more difficult, right? You need to figure out the author's gender. Google that person or use babyname.com to figure out what's the author's gender. If you can't figure out the author's gender, you cannot use just he as a generic. We don't have any generic singular pronoun. So you would have to say the author or repeat the author's last name. It becomes a little bit more complicated. But you do need to give the pronoun, if you can, of the right gender. Now let's practice a little bit about how to paraphrase. This is definitely the hardest part. How do you take the original, keep the original idea, but change it to your own words? First, read the original text clearly, carefully. Understand what it means. Understand the, exactly what is the point. What is the original author trying to say? Think about what's important in the text. Number three, summarize the key points in your own words. Usually it's best if you don't look at the original. If you keep looking at the original, you're tempted to just keep using the same words that the original author used. Find some synonyms. Use that synonym function or thesaurus function for some key words. Maybe in your paraphrase you want to use opposite words with not. Or change the sentence structure from active to passive or exchange clauses somehow you need to change it. Now I know that, that it's not common to take just one sentence and paraphrase it, but, um, but we're going to do that exercise in a second. What not to change? Numbers, percentages, dates, you don't need to paraphrase those. You, don't, you need to keep the, the original intention of the author. Don't try to change the original author's idea or overemphasize or change the original emphasis of the, the author. Okay, I know we don't usually paraphrase sentence by sentence, but I want you to practice. So turn to page 144 and literally work through some or all of these sentences. When you're, when you're finished, I've given you hints, try to, to keep those hints. There are several ways you could do it, but I've given you hints so that you can practice this skill. Then take a journal article and try to paraphrase one part, maybe the conclusions or uh, one of the findings. Take a longer sentence and make it shorter. Make sure that you add citations. This would be great, great, great practice for you. Okay, turn off the video and complete this exercise and then I'm going to show you the answers. Okay, here are some possibilities. There are other ways that you can do it, but these are some possibilities. See if you have followed the guidelines or the suggestions and come up with these answers. Okay, let's take a quiz. See what you've learned from the previous lessons by completing this quiz on the next few slides. Is this plagiarism? This is an excerpt from an article uh, from Svinsky um, in 2013. Look carefully at the original and the student sentence. Is this plagiarism? Turn off the tape if you need to and, and look at the sentences. Yes, this is plagiarism. This is something that should have had quotation marks because it's the author's exact words and there's no year for the author. This is a citation plus no quotation marks. It needs to have the, some kind of attribution. 
Is this plagiarism? No, this isn't plagiarism. It is the student that has accurately paraphrased the original author's idea and information and cited him. This is a citation with no quotation marks. Okay, we are finished. There is, There are tutor, tor, tutorials on several websites. I've given you Indiana University's website. They have one of the better tutorials. In fact, some teachers actually make you go through the tutorial and you can print out a certificate that you're that you've completed that tutorial. It incorporates many of the ideas that we've talked about. It, if you are still struggling with citations and documentation and plagiarism, go through carefully Indiana University's uh, tutorial. Many universities also have their own tutorials. See if your university has a tutorial. I've listed two from my university. But see other tutorials and continue to work on this. This is not something that comes easily but it's something that's very, very important to your professional career.